Do you have to be in the <laughs> meeting? <laughs> okay, I am now. I got a black one. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to call this meeting. I'm going to call this meeting to order. So the meeting is called to order, and video and audio recording has begun. We have two attendees, and I'm going to check in and see if they can hear me. So there's somebody named Nola Stephen or Stefan, and can you hear me, Nola? I can hear you, yes. Great, okay. And I'm going to mute you now, but it's good that you can hear me. And, um, yeah, what was that? And now um, Peggy Matthews is also here. And Peggy, can you hear me? You've got them both muted, Jim. Nola and Peggy are muted. Okay, there we I go, Peggy. Yeah. Yep. So, Peggy, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. I can My hear you. Unmute. Good. My unmute isn't working for Nola. Did, Nola, did you mute yourself? She so. Might. Oh, there, oh, there you go. There mm -hmm. we go. Okay. okay. So, so, welcome, everybody. Um, so here's what's going to happen. I've already called the meeting to order. I'm going to be moderating the meeting, which means I will call on people to speak so we don't have multiple people talking at once. Um, if you need to speak, this is for the panelists, the members of the committee, if you need to speak, you can raise your hand either physically like this or with the Zoom raise your hand, and then I'll recognize you when it's a good moment to do it. Any vote that we take will require a roll call. Um, and if there's public comment, I will recognize you and you'll introduce yourselves before you speak. And I'll remind you again of that when we get to that. I expect that we'll get to the public comment portion of the meeting sometime in 45 minutes to an hour, but it's unclear exactly when it'll be. What I wanna do now is go around the room and let the task force, mem task force members introduce themselves and I'll call on you one by one to introduce yourself. So Dave, you can go first. Oops. I think, let me unmute everybody. Oh, I think I can do that. Member. There we go. So Dave. I'm Dave Zomack. I'm Dave Zomack. I, I uh, function as staff to the task force and have been working on the dog park for a couple of years, uh, but I'm not officially a voting member. I'm, I'm just staff. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm Jim Pistrang, and I am the chair of the task force. And Nina? I am Nina Allen. I am a former member of the task force, but now I, I moved, so I'm just a non-voting member. <laughs> right. So you're a non-voting member of the task force is what you are. <clears throat> and Gina? Hi, I'm Gina Fusco, and I am a voting member of the task force. And Ted? I'm Ted Diamond and Ted. Vice Chair of the Task Force. Can you hear me? And Mike? Okay. Yes. Hi. Can you hear us, Ted? I'm Mike Chesworth and I've been on. Yeah. Okay. I, okay I've been Mike, on the Task Force that? since you sort of... with everyone and. Uh, I'm Mike Chessworth. Can you hear me? I'm Mike Chessworth, and uh, yes, I'm a dog park member. And okay. Jack. Yeah, I uh, Jack Jumsek. I'm Jack. in the uh, task force as well. I uh, live in South Amherst. Anna. Everybody, I'm Anna Dublin Gothier, um, Dog Park Task Force member, also South Amherst. And Ellen. Uh, my name is Ellen Kiter. I'm a voting member of the Task Force, and I too live in South Amherst. Okay. 
Um, the other person who sometimes appears at meetings is our animal control officer, but I don't know if she's going to appear tonight or not. We'll wait and see if she shows up. Um, a quick review of what our agenda is. We're going to appoint a secretary for the meeting. Then we will approve the minutes from the last two meetings from the January 21st meeting and the December 10th, 2019 meeting. Then we will hear about the current status of the project and the bids for construction. Then we'll talk briefly about our fundraising campaign and plans for that. Then we'll have a public comment period. Then other items not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. I don't have any yet, but maybe some will come up. And then we will set our next meeting date. So our first job is to appoint a secretary for the meeting. And this is gonna be an easy job because you can watch the video of the meeting afterwards and take your notes from that. So whoever Zoom raises their hand first can be the secretary for the meeting. One, two, three, go. <laughs> Anybody? I'll do it. Somebody? Yep, I said I'll do it. Okay. Is that Anna? <laughs> oh, Ellen will do it. Okay. No, it's nope. Ellen. <laughs> okay. Do you know... Thanks, Ellen. Okay, so the secretary. Sure. Thank you, Ellen. So Ellen is the secretary for the meeting. Okay, so we have two sets of minutes that we need to approve. And that's because at the January 21st meeting, we didn't have a quorum, so we couldn't approve the December 10th minutes. So we have the December 10th and the January 21st. What I'm gonna do is Ask to see if there's any comments or questions first on the December minutes, then on the January minutes, and then we'll vote to approve both of them at the same time. So we only have to vote once instead of twice. So does anybody have any questions, comments on the December 10th minutes? And you can raise your little Zoom hand if you do, or raise your regular hand. I don't see any hands raised. Anybody have any questions, comments, issues with the January 21st minutes? Okay. Jim, this um, isn't about the minutes, but do you want to make gonna it to... Proceed? Sorry, I was just going to say, do that? you want to mute our two members of the public? Do you want to mute our members of the public so that they don't have to yeah. mute themselves? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Sorry, my internet is unstable. Otherwise, I'd, yeah, so I'm a little delayed yeah, here. Yeah, mine <laughs> claims to be unstable as well. But there's uh, a we definite briefly delay. Have three attendees. Yeah. We briefly had three attendees, but it's back down to two again. Okay, we are now going to have a roll call vote on the approval of both the December 10th and January 21st minutes. Um, so we're gonna start with Gina and what's your vote? Yes means you approve the minutes, no means you don't. Gina. Yes, yes. Okay, and you should probably say your name and then yes or no. Okay, oh, but uh, you're good. Gina Cusco, yes. Good, Ted? Um, Ted Diamond, yes. Michael. Mike Chessworth. Mike Chessworth, yes and yes. Good. And Jack. Jack, you're muted. Uh, we did, um, I don't know if you're muted or not. Oh, you are muted. I don't know why yeah, that happened. Sorry about that. I said <laughs> unmute all. It's not better. I'm, I'm, I'm usually okay. I'm a Zoom guy too, so sorry about that. Uh, yes, Jack Jemsek. Okay. And Anna. Anna Devlin Gothier. Yes, and yes. Sorry about the delay. And Ellen. Okay, Ellen. Ellen. 
Ellen Kiter, yes and yes. Okay, we have unanimous approval of our minutes, so they are all approved. I'm just curious, I'm gonna say one, two, three, go, and when you hear me say go, raise your hand. I'm curious to see what the lag is. One, two, three, go. Wow, that was, that was like a five second lag. So we should just be aware of that. Okay, I think they, yeah. So Dave, I think we're gonna turn things over to you to give us an update on the project and the bid status. Okay, good. Um, so I'll try to be brief. My internet is a little um, unstable here at times too. So if I freeze or something, give me a signal and I'll keep going or stop or whatever or repeat things. So um, let me start. I, I think we have really good news. Uh, we're excited on the town level, on the staff level. Um, we think we have a project and we are confident we have a, a contractor. So we are proceeding uh, toward construction. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go into tremendous detail on bids. Um, there are a number of things that still need to be worked out. So I may speak a little bit in generalities, but um, the bottom line is we got, and I should have counted before, but these are all, you can see these on the town website. Let me just count them, one, two, three. Um, I didn't count them beforehand, but it looks like 13 different bids. There was a wide range of, uh, of uh, bids here that range from roughly $300,000 above $600,000. So um, I won't go into great detail on that. We can read into that, but the bottom line is certainly the bidding climate benefited us. Uh, and a lot of that, frankly, has to do with COVID-19. Um, um, contractors are very hungry right now. There's not a lot of money out there. There's not a lot of projects out there. So um, it is what it is. We were fortunate in a way to bid it when we did. So we have uh, the lowest qualified bidder was a group out of New Bedford called Valiant Construction. Um, we are proceeding as if they are the uh, selected uh, contractor to do the project. Uh, I say that with a little bit of um, just qualifying that a little bit because there's a number of things that in a public bid has to have to be done. So we, uh, we've gotten very good references on this, um, on this company and we're working. Uh, Anthony Delaney is our um, procurement officer and Anthony is working with Valiant and I'm working with the Stanton Foundation to really kind of um, uh, dot all the I's and cross the T's. So it'll take us a little while to contract with Valiant. Um, there's a process with the Stanton Foundation that we need to go through. Uh, in short, we need to get a memorandum of understanding with the Stanton Group uh, that, uh, that really outlines their expectations of us, but they know that we are going with the Valiant Group um, we're in the process of creating the or uh, responding to the MOU with Stanton and that MOU uh, sets the tone or sets the stage for um, Stanton to cut the check uh, which will be for $225,000 from Stanton to the town of Amherst. So I think it's all good news there. Uh, we feel good about Valiant. Um, the bid, the bid itself, and this is a the bid itself is around $300,000. There's some, there's some discussion that always happens with a bid uh, to make sure that uh, we're all on the same page, but the base bid, which included all of our alternatives uh, is around $300,000. Um, so that's a very good number for us. Um, it includes, you know, the shade structures, the the parking, all of the things that you all wanted in the, the project are included, 
There are a few things that are excluded. We know that the entrance kiosk is excluded. We're assuming that is coming from uh, a donor that Carol has arranged for. Um, things like uh, the shed for equipment was not included in the bid, um, but shade structures, sand mounds, uh, dog watering stations, um, you know, electrical irrigation, all of that was included in the bid for around $300,000. Um, so we're going to proceed now. Uh, we've been in touch with the Natural Heritage Program. They understand that we want to proceed um, as soon as we possibly can. Uh, we will, um, and I can get into more detail on this later, but we'll be required to do um, a survey for grasshopper sparrows out on the, um, out on the old landfill out on the site. Uh, that could cost us some money or we may get that uh, donated in kind, but we're working on that. So the goal would be to begin construction as soon as we get approvals from the Stanton Foundation, we get the money in hand. Uh, we can't start and we can't um, you know, uh, complete the contract until we have all the money needed to at least cover the base bid in hand. So that'll mean getting the Stanton Foundation. So we're still a couple of weeks away from having that. Um, but I think it's all, all good news at this point. Um, Jack, I see you have your hand raised. Do you want to ask a question or make a comment now? Uh, yeah, I, I just I I was looking. I found I found the uh, the bid site, so I just was looking for the link um, for that. So okay, I found it. I will lower one your of, hand. Cool. Mm. Yeah, one of the. Um, one of the biggest pieces of the, the bidding process was in order to, um, in order to uh, level out the bowl, you know, the, 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 the area we've selected for the, for the large dog area is quite a bowl shaped, um, you know, the topography there, the old landfill is, is very much a bowl. So we do have to fill in that bowl to make it more, uh, it, make it easier to create the walkways for the large dog, um, area and for the shade structures. So there's quite a bit of fill and that's, we're still having some conversations with the contractor about that, but I think we're, we're in a good place. Um, so that's, that's the good news. That's where we are. Um, I can talk a little bit about um, next steps, but I think it would be completing the MOU with, with Stanton, getting the funding all in place. Um, we are trying to finalize, you know, we have three sources of funding. So we're really trying to get down to, uh, uh, you know, getting all of our, 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 our funding together. We have private donations that have come in. We have in-kind donations that have come in or will come in. We have the remaining CPA dollars, and then we have the money from the Stanton Foundation. So I'll be working with planning and um, um, uh, the procurement officer to make sure our whole package has everything to cover the base bid, as well as any contingency money that we might need. And, um, you know, if all goes well, um, you know, we'll cover everything. I know we want to talk a little bit about fundraising and whether we might need more fundraising. I think I'm still a week or 10 days away from knowing whether we're going to need any more fundraising, but we're in a pretty good shape right now to, to move this thing forward. So maybe I'll stop there and take questions. Um, I have a question. Um, just curious about the selection process. Did we, was it basically just the lowest number was selected? Was there, could there have been any consideration for local versus longer distance contractors or anything like that? No, there really isn't the law doesn't allow for that. The law says uh, in Massachusetts, a municipality must take the lowest qualified bidder. Mm -hmm. So you start with the lowest bid, you make sure that the contractor knew what they were bidding on, and then you check references. Um, you make sure that they're qualified to do the job. And that's what the law requires of us. Okay, Ted? Oh. What? May I ask what? a question? I, I think um, um, no, excuse me. Um, no, actually, you can't. There'll be a time later when you can, but we're 
limiting the questions right now to the task force. So remember your question. Okay. So can I just clarify that it's the dog park that we're talking about now? Oh yes, the dog it's absolutely. Park. It's, well, it's the dog yes. park we're talking about. Absolutely. Right, only, right. Only, only the dog park. Yes. Okay, yeah. only the dog park. Okay, thanks. Okay. I, I so was, Ted, I yes. was curious. I was curious as to whether, in consideration of the bids, uh, you uh, examine the materials and the actual specifics of what they're proposing, because there can be a wide variety in the quality of fencing and sprinkler systems and and even asphalt. You know, uh, so are there certain specifications that? Uh, you know, they have to meet, or how do you ensure that they're not going to give you schlocky stuff? Yeah, that's a great, if I could, Jim, I, I'm happy to answer that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's a great question. So I'm not sure the whole task force knows this. I, I'm pretty, I know Jim does. I'm not sure if Ted does, but um, um, two thirds of the way through the, the pulling the bid together, um, I really reached out to our DPW because I felt as though we needed some additional eyes on the on the project and some additional input. Uh, in addition to Mike Liu, who who is um, was hired from Berkshire Design, so we brought in a a, a team. We brought in um, Jason Skeels, uh, who's a who's our town engineer, and we also brought in Paul Dethier, who's uh, works in the engineering department. Paul is actually a um, landscape architect. So the two of them really uh, went through the bid specifications and the bid plans, uh, the, the, the plan set with a fine tooth comb. They made some pretty significant improvements, we think, to the plan. And that's actually the plan that went out to bid. Um, I can probably, it's a pretty big document, but I'd be happy to get the, you know, I can send around the bid specifications to the task force if you like, and you can read through them. Um, so what happens, Ted, just to follow up on the rest of your question. So um, uh, DPW used um, uh, industry standards in that bid set. So quality of everything from the quality of the fill that goes uh, in the basin that we're talking about to the quality of the um, uh, of the bituminous pavement that'll go in the parking lot to the um, to the uh, walkways all of that is laid out and must meet the spec that uh, they bid on DPW is also going to be our eyes and ears they are going to be the clerk of the works for this project so they will be out on site every day during construction, which is a huge plus. So um, that was a pretty major addition to our team. Uh, and we feel like it really made the bid process go more smoothly and it'll certainly make the construction um, um, you know, more rigorous um, for the contractor. So we're feeling pretty good about that, but I'd be happy to send the, the bid specs to people. Um, and again, all of the like features through. that Mike, yeah, all of the features that Mike, you know, included from, you know, dog uh, watering stations to the uh, to the uh, shade structures, all of that was included. But I can send yeah. you the bid spec. Great. Yeah. And so I'll actually also, if you send it to me, I'll probably also put it up on the task force web page, and maybe I'll put a link from the web page to the to the site and the town site that has the bids as well. So everything is out there for people to see. Yeah, that might be more efficient because this is going to be, these are going to be huge files. So yeah. let me get it so to you, send them to me and I'll get them. You might, you might do a link to the task force and just have a link back to, and we can uh, have them be on the, on the town webpage. Cause I'll send the yeah. plans and the uh, specs. Good. And, and, and he, again, he, uh, to Ted's question, um, we'll have an opportunity to go out there and do site visits with our engineering staff and with the contractor as things are being built. So if there are issues, if there's, you know, um, you know, whatever, we see things as, as it's going on, the, the sooner we correct them, the better. 
Any other questions for Dave about the project? Yeah, Jack. Um, I don't see the bid results. Those aren't posted yet. Um, There's like six or seven documents on that. Are you looking on the town like the uh, procurement uh, website, Jack? Yeah, it's it's uh, bid postings. Yeah. And the results are not there. No, you got the IFB, the attachment A, the addendum one, specs. Okay, couple I'll, things I'll check, yeah. prevailing wages, shade systems. Sure, I can. I can ask Anthony to put those up there. Yeah, it's not okay. something I usually look for. So, but I'll, no, it's good. We should get them up there. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so the next thing on our agenda is fundraising campaign status. So I'll tell you the little bit I know, and then maybe I'll see what Ellen, Ted, or anybody else have to say. Um, what I know is that we did receive some nice private donations, um, and mostly based on, you know, some based on some letters and contacts that I had made last summer, and others from other task force members. And about a month ago, when we were getting serious about looking at bids, um, we asked all those people to actually send the money because as Dave said, we need to have the money in hand in order to actually sign a contract. And they did. So we did pretty well on kind of our first phase of looking for larger donations. Um, we really haven't completed it. You know, I know we had planned to talk more to the business community, but as we're all aware, it's a pretty difficult time to be asking any business to make any kind of donation. You know, pretty much every business is struggling. Um, so I think the plan is still to be reaching out and asking for more larger donations from businesses, but we're not gonna do it yet. We really need to wait till there's a bit of more of a recovery. Um, Ellen, you wanna contribute something beyond that? I see your hand raised, go ahead. Oh, I wanted to. I wanted to ask if the town has received uh, the pledge from the Amherst Rotary, five thousand dollars, I believe. The answer is yes. Um, we did receive. Dave. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So. Um, so so yeah, I think go Jim, ahead, Dave. Jim has a list. Jim has the list of all the donors. I think, you know, I think we need to talk a little bit about whether that's kind of a confidential list or, or not, but all of the donors did receive um, a letter confirming their, uh, the generosity of their gift and also, um, you know, the amount of their gift from the town. I think I would leave it to Jim and Ted to decide if, you know, additional letters are going out from the task force. Yeah. And I've also been attempting to keep track because some of the donations involve having a, a plaque of some sort on a bench or something larger, something like that. So I'm trying to keep track of all those. And I do think at some point we should come up with and send out a letter to everybody who's donated something so far from the task force. I don't know if anyone wants to volunteer to draft something, um, but but it doesn't have to happen instantly, but it is something we should do at some point, even though they've already received a letter from the town, something from us would be good as well. Ted. Um, so, you know, obviously the, uh, the situation has changed uh, the world in so many ways, and especially when it comes to going out looking for donations for anything, um, it's gonna be very difficult for quite a while, probably, Till after the park is already under construction because um, things aren't going to change. Businesses aren't going to be ready to make large commitments until they know where they stand. So I feel like our original strategy, which was, you know, 
developing a list of people and businesses who are able to donate is possibly um, a little, it, it's taking a back seat to the idea of sponsorships after it's open or as it's going to open or ongoing sponsorships. Because I think while we still can solicit people, especially as construction is taking place, I think it'll be a lot easier, not only because it'll be hopefully several months down the road, but because when there's something concrete happening, as we've said before, it's a lot easier for people to, uh, to feel comfortable about writing a check. But I also think that as time goes by, the things that we talked about in terms of ongoing sponsorships, that may be something that um, businesses will want to get be part of and uh, you know, be able to be an ongoing source of revenue for the parks for maintenance. It sounds like the bids that we got are significantly below what we were thinking they might be. So we're fortunate, as Dave was saying, that we got kind of a COVID discount on the park. And that kind of uh, offset the fact that we're not doing this fundraising that we had expected to do. It sounds like we don't really need a huge amount of money, probably, Dave, in order to sign the contract and start construction, which we didn't anticipate that being the case when we started. Yeah, I, I, I believe it's correct that based on the Stanton money and the remaining CPA funds and the donations, we have enough to meet this bid that we're going to be accepting. Does that sound right to you, Dave? I, I believe that to be true, but I'd like still a little bit of time just to work these numbers a little bit more with our accounting department and with the engineers. So. I think we're, as I said at the outset, I think we're in good shape. Um, but I just, you know, as I look at, as I look at the potential for additional costs with, you know, um, obviously having a contingency, uh, anything to do with, with plaques, with donor acknowledgement, with, um, with the, um, the uh, supply shed, the equipment shed, things of that sort. I just want to make sure we're, we're we still have a comfortable cushion there. So, I think by the time we all have our next meeting, we'll have all those numbers rock solid. Um, but I'm feeling good about it. But I, to go to Ted's point, um, we may be talking about a different kind of fundraising. And once we put a shovel in the ground, maybe we have some sort of socially distanced uh, 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 groundbreaking event. I think we might. You know, I think it might also appeal, I think there'll be more appeal to individuals as well that, you know, even if people want to make 50 or $100 donations, those add up and we can use those in the future for, you know, when signage gets uh, damaged or old or, you know, weathered or whatever. There, there's going to be a lot of ongoing expenses to this thing. So, so yeah, I think we're in a, we're in a comfortable place. But um, let me crank those numbers and then we can focus on this more specifically at your next meeting. Good. That sounds, that sounds like it makes sense to me. Um, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly have fundraising and plans moving forward be a top topic at our next meeting. So we can talk about what strategy we have. But I think we had talked all along about shifting towards annual member, not exactly memberships, but annual sponsorships and looking for many smaller donations to cover maintenance costs and annual costs. So I think that's what we'll be heading towards um, and still hoping and getting those sponsorships from businesses as well as they're able to do them. Yeah, I do and agree. I, I do agree with Ted. Now is not the time for us to be sending out letters to businesses. Um, so I think that can wait. Anything else on fundraising? Yeah, Jack. Um, I guess it's been a while. I'm trying to put my arms around the value of the, the different grants we have, you know, because we know we got the bid for 300,000. What was the sum total for Stanton again, just to 
jog my memory and and you know what what are we looking at in terms of I know it's complicated it'd be nice to have like a little table or something like that but just generally if someone can go over those numbers again just to refresh my memory sure so we started Dave, out with um, yeah so we started out with a twenty five thousand um, dollar grant from Stanton for the design which is mostly spent at this point on, on Berkshire design um, if all goes well, that leads to a $220,000 grant for a construction. And that's what I was talking about now is we're, we're moving toward that now that we have our selected bidder. Um, and uh, we'll do an MOU with uh, Stanton and get that money flowing to the town. Um, we started out with $90,000 in CPA funds. And we had to spend some of that money on wetlands, uh, wetlands work on the southern end. Um, and then the, uh, the PCUP, the uh, post-closure use permit around, uh, around uh, building a dog park on a landfill. Um, so I need to kind of zero in on how much of that CPA funding is still remaining. And then the third pot of money is really the private uh, donations that you all have have brought in. Um, and then lastly is just the in-kind piece. Uh, I think the big ticket item there is the entry kiosk, which uh, we do need Carol to just confirm that the donor of that um, is still on board to, to build that entry kiosk for us. Yeah. So those are the and, major pieces. Yeah. And in terms of the private donations, plus things like rotary, we're talking over $45,000 that have been contributed. So that clearly brings us that plus the Stanton plus the remaining CPA brings us over that $300,000 mark, which is good news. Um, we might actually get a dog park eventually, who knows? Um, anything else on fundraising or money at this time? Um, I think we can, I'm going to open things up to public comment. I see a third attendee, Colleen Austin. And Colleen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. I Great. came in late, so I missed a lot of the beginning. <clears throat> okay. Well, lucky for you, the whole thing is being recorded. So, Great. you know, in, when you run out of Netflix shows, everybody can watch our meeting over and over <laughs> again. Um, so, so um, I'm- Is it okay to ask a question now? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so I'm Noah Actually, Steven. First, first, if you would identify yourself with your name and address, that would yeah. be- I'm Noah Steven, 31 Trillium Way in Amherst Woods. Okay. So I don't know if you can see me. Um, no, we can't actually. Okay. No, that's fine. I haven't brushed my hair very well, so this is all good. So anyway, my question is, um, I wanted to sort of clarify for myself, for us, what, what point we're at in the process. Has a contract been signed with the construction company? Um, why don't you go through all of your questions first and then we'll try and answer them. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I, we are dog people, love dogs, but we have some concerns about certainly the grasshopper sparrow issue, the, the wildlife that goes through that, how that would be affected by dogs, what about the noise and the smell from this? I know I read something, and I'm sorry I didn't make notes on it, but there's another dog park where there was information that the town or the area had to ask uh, for some uh, money for, to, or help with maintenance, et cetera, because of the care of the park. So, you know, I, many dog owners are responsible, many are not responsible, and I have seen the result of that so and also I'm wondering about the final cost to us as taxpayers I know that you've been talking a lot about donations and grants etc but my thought about this is I uh, 
my own our our feelings are that maybe a dog park at this time is not a good idea would there be issues and problems from uh, in terms of wildlife in terms of noise in terms of of smell in terms of upkeep and um in terms of the money that would be going from the town this is probably the worst time for us to get involved in a project that is going to take money that may be badly needed in other areas. So one information about the, the process right now, about input of different people, I, I can tell obviously that you're uh, a ways along in the process. Can you fill me in in terms of some of this? Okay, I'll, I'll try and give a shot at it first and then others can add in if they want. Um, so first of all, I don't know if you're on the Amherst Woods listserv that's been discussing this, but I posted a fairly long post there that actually answers pretty much all these questions, but I'll go over them again now anyway. Sure, so, I don't think I am on the listserv, but uh, I, I certainly okay. will check. Okay, so um, first of all, this year, Coming into this process about three years into it, we've been working for a long time in the dog park. Um, right. And where we're at now is the contract has been put out to bid. Nothing has, yes. I mean, the project has been put out to bid. And right. we're in the process of selecting a contractor and we're right. closing in on that. No contract yeah. has been signed yet. No contract will be signed until all the money's in hand and the contractor who's put in this bid has been, been completely vetted. So that's the right. status now. We, we expect the contract will be signed sometime in the near future, within the next month, I would hope. Okay, going over some of your concerns, um, which first of all, I really wanna point out that there are concerns as well. All the things you talked about have been discussed in quite a bit of detail over these three years of meetings. And you're, I don't know if you can see our faces or not, but you're looking at a group of people who really care about all the same things that you care about. But getting to right. the specifics, um, in terms of the birds and the rest of the landfill, first of all, the dog park is occupying just a very small portion of the landfill. It's occupying 1.5 acres out of the landfill that's over 50 acres. Right. Um, and the dog park has been placed in a corner of the landfill that actually can't be seen by the rest of the landfill. We're kind of in a bowl that Dave referenced with a rise uh, in a sort of a, a ridge beyond where the dog park is and then it drops down to the other side and that's where the rest of the landfill is. So standing in the dog park, you can't even see the rest of the landfill. And if you're a human or a bird in the rest of the landfill, you can't see the dog park. Um, so that was done deliberately because we don't want to have an impact on the rest of the landfill. We've discussed and vetted this project with local people such as the Conservation Department as well as state wildlife people and bird authorities. And the one concern that came up was the breeding of the grasshopper sparrow. There was never any concern that right. once birds were done nesting and breeding, they couldn't cohabit this landfill with the dog park. The concern was with the nesting while the construction was going on. It was the noise of the construction that was the only concern of all the experts we talked to. So we agreed that if there's evidence of nesting during the construction season, we will hold off on the project and we will only be building if there's no evidence of nesting of the grasshopper sparrows. Nowhere has anybody stated any thoughts that the life of the birds would be disrupted once the construction was complete. Um, in terms of noise and smells, um, I, you know, again, it wasn't the concern of anybody we consulted with, and I don't think it's going to be noticed on the other side of the landfill from where the dog park is. Um, it's interesting, when I, there used to be a, a local kennel in our neighborhood, and when you wandered by it with a dog, um, all the dogs were barking like crazy and it was a noisy place. I personally haven't experienced that with dog parks. It's, it's not full of dogs barking like crazy. The dogs are running around, they're not on a leash, they're not being restrained, and they tend to run around and play and not bark that much. Um, and again, 
all of the people we consulted weren't concerned with the actual presence of the dog park once it's done with its construction phase. In terms of the money, there is no town money that isn't already allocated that's going to be spent on this project. And if suddenly, magically, we all decided we're not going to have a dog park after all, none of the money targeted the dog park could be used for anything else. The CPA funds that were granted to us were granted specifically for the dog park. The private donations we've gotten are specifically for the dog park. And the Stanton Foundation funds are specifically for the dog park. So we're not taking money away from any other budget or any other portion of the town. I understand very well the state that the town is going to be in budget-wise. We're losing a huge amount of revenue. Um, Lord only knows what we're going to get from the state this year, but it's not going to be as much as any other year, and there's going to be a lot of constraints and budgets. But none of the dog park funds could be used to alleviate any of that. The dog park funds are specifically targeted towards the dog park and can't be allocated to anything else. In terms how of much the money was of, that? Um, how, how much well, money is the town money that was allocated? So back about three years ago, um, $90,000 was allocated out of the Community Preservation Act. Not all of that exists anymore. I think about half of it or a little more than half was already used for the different kinds of permitting and studies that needed to be done to make sure the landfill was a safe place to put the dog park. So the CPA money is the only money that you might consider town money but CPA, Community Preservation Act money, is in a different category from the rest of the budget. It can only yeah. be used for certain projects that it has been allocated to by the CPA committee and then approved by either town meeting before the council or by the council. It can't be used for anything else. It can't be given back to the town to be used for anything else other than this project. And then the Stanton yeah. money and the private donations have nothing to do with town budget or town funds. Right. In terms of in terms of money for maintenance, um, yes, DPW will be swinging by to empty the trash, and they will be mowing now and then. They'll basically be doing the same kind of maintenance that they do at all of the other parks and all of the areas that they maintain in town. So it is a little bit more work for them, but not enough to warrant them asking for more budget money or to hire any other people. So there's no additional funding being requested in any of the town budgets to support the dog park. We also uh -huh. will, case, hang on, let me just finish a little more. We yeah, yeah. recognize that there might be some larger maintenance projects every couple of years, and there's two different ways to approach that. The same Stanton Foundation that give, gave us this large amount to build the dog park also offers maintenance grants, and we intend to apply for those as they're needed. Our, our um, relationship with the Stanton Foundation is a very good one. They were very happy with our initial grant proposal, and they feel that we've done everything correctly and done everything well, and we feel it's highly likely that we'll get these maintenance grants when we need them. In addition to that, we do plan on forming a Friends of Amherst Dog Park group that will have maintenance days, kind of similar to the way the Friends of Puffer's Pond works, where I think either once or twice a year they gather and they do a bunch of maintenance so the community gets involved. And we have every reason to believe that our Friends group will be successful and will do that same kind of work. So we don't feel that this is going to be a financial burden on the town. I'm going to see if Peggy or Colleen have any questions at this point. So Peggy, do you have any questions or anything you want to say? Yes. Hi. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, uh, my concern mostly is how far along in the process this um, dog park location is, um, considering that there was really, as far as I can tell, um, no reaching out to the neighbors or abutters for the project. And I, I read in the notes that there were no neighbors and abutters to the project, but I remember, I'm sure you all remember that when um, a, solar array, a solar array was proposed on that very same location, the town really emphasized how important it was 
to reach out to neighbors and to reach out to abutters. So my concern is that Amherst Woods and some of the areas in East Woods that are directly abutting the old landfill haven't really been reached out. A lot of our residents here don't know about the dog park or don't have any idea how far along this task force, uh, this task force is in its proceedings. So that was, that's my first, it's a comment, just a concern and a comment. Um, let's see, second of all, I wanted to ask, I looked on the webpage for the task force and I couldn't find um, the authorities, the, the, um, any documents around what bird authorities were actually contacted and um, any documents that talked about the potential impact of an endangered species uh, with an ongoing presence of dogs and foot traffic. So that would be something I'd be interested, it's a request, um, if, if the town and the task force could post on your webpage the specific um, um, bird authorities and documents that were used to um, um, concerning the impact of a dog park on protected habitat. As far as I, I googled and I couldn't find um, any information. In fact, the Boneyard Dog Park, which I believe the town cited as an example um, that this, uh, this proposed park would be similar, um, one, in its, in its considerations of a location, it also is on a landfill but there's no protected habitat on that. And one of the guidelines in their consideration was to make sure that there were, that there was no sensitive um, habitat in the vicinity. So that, that's a concern that I have. Um, let's see, another comment is that, um, uh, Jim, you mentioned that the, that the funds used for the project could not be used uh, for anything other than the dog park. But my question to the task force is, um, if it's found that there are problems with bird habitat and a dog park coexisting, could those funds be used for another location for a dog park? So um, I'm sorry to be bringing this. I'm the vice president of the Homeowners Association here in Amherst Woods, and I'm sorry to bring this to you at such a late uh, time in the process, but we were not notified. In fact, I didn't hear from anyone from the town about this project. Um, so um, we're coming to the party late, but we have some real concerns about the state's mandate to protect this habitat in perpetuity and the impact of the dog park on that habitat. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Jack, I saw you raise your hand. So I, I, uh, I worked, uh, I have been working research drive for maybe 15 years in the last 20 years, uh, off and on. And I, I see a lot of trespassing there, a lot of dog walking uh, that's happening in that area of the landfill that is beyond the area where the dog park is into the the uh, grasshopper sparrow habitat. And my feeling is with the dog park, that would actually restrict, you know, these trespassers going into the actual habitat area. Clearly the dog park is removed from the habitat. It's out of the, the, the view shed of that habitat. And it actually probably could enhance that habitat in terms of keeping activity down near the road. Uh, you know, outside the, the view shed of the grasshoppers and vice versa. Just wanted to say that there, there's a lot of people that are trespassing up in the landfill, walking through there with dogs. Uh, so I see this actually could be an improvement uh, in terms of protecting that grasshopper habitat. Um, and I'd like to make a brief comment about your first point about um, being new to the game and not being aware of things. And, you know, I'm, I guess I apologize. We've been a, we've been a very public process for the past three years. There have been newspaper articles um, back when we first um, 
proposed to town meeting that we get the CPA funding. There was a big article then talking very <coughs> specifically about the location we were going to be using. And there have been articles in every six months to a year, there's been another article in the paper talking about the progress of the park. Obviously, all of our meetings are public meetings under open meeting law, so they're all posted with the town. So, you know, it's frustrating. There's always people that you don't reach. Um, but we've really, you know, we've been a very public process all the way through. We're never trying to hide anything in terms of location on the landfill. Um, it we had we didn't have very many choices we were very committed to not use any space that was already being used as a public space we didn't want to take away a part of groff park or or mill river or anything like that um you know dog park might be lovely on the common in town but nobody was interested in that um so and there were other things that we were very concerned about. We wanted the dog park to be on public transportation. We wanted it to be accessible for people with different kinds of accessibility needs. And for all those reasons, even though there were some negatives about the landfill, certainly it was more costly for us to build on a landfill. Um, it became by far the best choice. You know, everybody thinks of Amherst as this wide open place with lots and lots of places where you can do something like this. But the truth is, there were very few choices of where we could build the park. Um, again, we didn't take any of this lightly and we really thought things through. And <clears throat> if you go take a look at where the dog park is, or if you go to the listserv and see what I posted, which is a map of the dog park showing where it is on the landfill, you'll see that we're way off in a corner and we really don't feel that what we're going to be doing or what the dog park is going to be doing is going to be disrupting to the landfill. Um, Col anyone else have any comments on Peggy's comments or can I move on to Colleen? Yeah, Dave. I'm just un unmuting myself. Yeah, just to um, kind of build on what you were talking about, Jim. Um, and first of all, for Peggy or anybody, any of the um, uh, the attendees, um, I would be happy to meet with any or all of you, you know, safely, socially distanced uh, out on the site or, or on the landfill anytime in the coming days or weeks to answer any of your questions. Um, I did want to reiterate that um, there have certainly been multiple, multiple media stories on this project over the last three years. Um, I did also want to note that uh, this project has gone through um, at least three, if not four, major town processes over the last three years. So as Jim noted, um, it was highly uh, and extensively discussed on the floor of town meeting. Um, it went through the planning board, the conservation commission, and the design review board. Um, Jim, and just the disability, confirm, disability access. And the disability access advisory committee, all public meetings, all posted meetings. Um, I would be very surprised if the direct debutters uh, should have gotten planning board, CONCOM, and, and other uh, notices, but that would have been many, many months ago because this, this project is has been on the on the on the drawing board for a long, long time. We are working very closely with the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. This is a state agency. Their mandate is to protect the habitat of rare and endangered species. Uh, we have had multiple meetings with them at their Westboro office. Uh, they have been working with us from the beginning on the design of the dog park. Um, nothing can proceed um, and nothing has proceeded without their full knowledge of the, of the project. We've also worked with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, they oversee capped landfills and active landfills, but this one is capped. Um, and we have submitted all the necessary uh, documents uh, that they need to review this project and uh, approve this project. And I did wanna reiterate finally that of the roughly 55 acres of the dog of the uh, old landfill, the, the uh, South landfill, um, our plan is to protect 
50 or more of those acres in a conservation restriction. So uh, as Jim noted, this is about one and a half acres. The entire rest of the site will be permanently protected in a conservation restriction that will be held by the Kestrel Trust. And that conservation restriction is being required um, as part of the solar landfill project across the street on the north landfill. So the entire site will be permanently protected as open space. Um, the grassland habitat will be um, specifically managed for uh, grassland birds like the um, grasshopper sparrow, bobolink, kestrel, American kestrel, um, uh, and similar savanna sparrows, uh, similar species that uh, require open field habitat. So in the end, the Natural Heritage Program is, has been extremely supportive and very grateful that we are protecting in a, it's kind of a, I would call it almost a, um, a groundbreaking project where uh, I've never been involved uh, in a project where a municipality put a conservation restriction on a capped landfill. So this is, uh, this is novel, this is unique, and um, all, all the, the state players have been very, um, pleased with, with uh, ultimately what the outcome will be. The trail will be maintained on the south side of the uh, landfill. We will also maintain the sledding hill for those people, uh, families and, and children who have enjoyed that uh, on the south end of the landfill. All of those, um, those activities will remain uh, for generations to come. Thanks. Thank you. So I want to check in with our third attendee, Colleen, to see if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Um, so um, my name is Colleen Austin, and I live on Larkspur Drive. And first, I just want to say that um, it's clear that you've been working for three years. And between the fundraising and the planning, there's a tremendous amount of work that's been invested. And I appreciate all of your um, time and commitment to this as a dog lover. <laughs> Um, I had two brief questions and one, I just can't look at the website at the same time. The um, entrance to the park, is that off of Wildflower or off of Old Belchertown Road? It is off of Old Belchertown Road. So where the like little tiny parking spot is now will be where the dog park is. I mean the entrance to it, kind of there. Um. There's like a fence know. and like two spots that you can park in currently where people, when they do walk their dogs park. It's, it's beyond that heading towards Amherst Woods, away okay. from Route 9. <clears throat> okay. Basically, if, if you look on your right hand side, right before you get to the woods, there's a kind of a little bowl area of the park, a grassy area, and that's where it's going to be. I mean, area of the landfill. Okay. So it's after that, after that, what looks like sort of a maintenance entrance and a little clump of trees, and then it's beyond that. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had was um, for people that walk the dogs now, there's like a loop that people tend to do. Um, are they still going to be able to do that outside of the park, or will there, that be restricted in some way? I would say, um, actually, I'll let Dave answer that. So that's a great, great question. I'm not familiar with the loop that people currently, um, I know where the trail is. I know where the Robert Frost Trail goes through. Uh, I'm not familiar with um, where people walk up on the mound itself, up on the landfill itself. Yeah, when um, you pull into the, um, that gated area, <clears throat> it's paved for a short period of time. And then to the right, there's a, a path that kind of makes a big circle. And um, people tend to go around that a few times with their dogs. Right. So, so I'll, I'll answer your question in just a second. So this is a, it's a very interesting kind of illustrative question. So um, from the natural heritage standpoint, um, the, whole, the whole concept of having people and dogs walk right through the prime habitat of a of state listed species is in fact counter to everything they do. So in fact, our, our just our human activity and the, you know, just what we all do, taking a walk ourselves or with our children or with our dogs or a mountain bike is exactly the kind of interruption to breeding habitat and breeding activity that the natural heritage would like to cease. Um, so 
So our goal here is kind of twofold. We're, this group is talking about the dog park. We also have the project across the street, which will be a, a solar landfill, um, or excuse me, solar on the landfill. Um, that project is going to result in the conservation restriction I talked about for the, the grasshopper sparrow habitat on the south landfill. In addition to that, that project will have as one of its elements a fence around the cap of the old landfill. So this is something that's been talked about for years. Um, it is part of the solar project that the remainder of the cap for the south landfill will be fenced at some point. I don't think we'll see this until 2021 or 22. It's not part of the dog park project. There will be a fence around the dog park, but eventually the cap of the old landfill will be fenced. This is something that DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection would like to see. And it's also something that the Natural Heritage uh, Program is supportive of. What we've designed in our, in our plan for the, the area is to have a loop trail on the outside of the fence. So you'll be able to kind of, um, you will be able to come down, uh, the, 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 the last speaker was talking about the, 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 the paved area where two, two cars can park now. So you will be able to continue, um, let's say if you, if you well, I'm trying to get my bearings, you'll be able to go around the fenced area is what I'm saying. And you'll be able to connect to the Robert Foss Trail on the south. We also intend to have kind of a viewing area up there where bird watchers, or if you want to look at the view of the Mount Holyoke Range, um, we might have a little platform up there where people can get a little elevated. It'll be a five foot fence around the cap of the landfill. But what will be excluded from that is the Robert Frost Trail, uh, obviously the area over near the pond and the sledding hill to the south. So uh, that, right, was a that long... makes lots of sense to me. Yeah. And thank you for such a thorough answer. <laughs> Yeah, and so bottom line, you'll still be able to make the loop just outside the fence. Right, perfect. And I just want to add, in terms of people and dogs making the loop, um, any I would assume in that area, a dog would need to be on a leash. But anywhere where is a dog, where a dog is allowed to be on a leash, they will still be allowed to be there. The dog park doesn't change any of the town bylaws outside of the dog park in terms of what is permitted on leash or off leash for dogs. Great. Um, I would like to ask for some clarification in terms okay, of this the is Nola. Why don't you tell us who you yeah. are again? Yep, it's Nola Stephen, 31 okay. Trillium Way. Hi, I don't know if you want me to do one at a time, but in terms of what the last speaker talked about, in terms of the location, is there a map available so we could see that? Um, boy, you know, I just posted something on the list, sir, on the Amherst Woods list, sir. But I will put I will put that map up on the task force webpage tomorrow morning, probably. That would um, be good, so we could see where exactly you know what the location is. Um, so my I'll try to go through these quickly. The second question is about parking. Uh, with uh, let's say a number of dog owners come with their dogs, there are only the two spaces as has been mentioned. What about parking? Okay, so the, the plans include 18 new parking spots along Old Belchertown Road. Um, oh. I know there was some, some concern on the list serve. You know, there were people, I read some of the comments of people talking about a giant paved parking lot and an 18 car parking lot is not very big. It comes out to less than four one hundredths of an acre. So a very small parking lot along Old Belchertown Road, which also will be out of view of the rest of the landfill. Yes, Anna. Oh, um, uh, so, oh, sorry. I had no, two other things. No, like, okay. Can I just follow up really quickly? Um, if you yes, Google Amherst course. Dog Park, um, if you Google Amherst Dog Park, you'll come up with all of the Gazette articles and the Amherst Indie articles and all of the media about the dog park. And many of them have, uh, or at least one of them, the one from 4-16-2019, um, has a, a rough map of the park and you can see where the parking spots are along the road. Okay, a uh, health and safety question. What about dog feces? Will owners be required to clean those up? 
you know, for people who do walk there, or do the loop or whatever, um, is that is there going to be some requirement that the feces is controlled? Um, yes, absolutely. There's a whole set of dog park rules that we will have for our dog park, similar to others. Again, if you if you Google on AmherstDogPark.org, so AmherstDogPark, all one word, dot org, you will find our web page that includes a separate page all about the rules of the park. And yes, absolutely, one of the requirements is owners clean up after their dogs. Um, right. Hang on. One of our committee members has a comment, so Jack, go ahead. Uh, I would offer to share my screen uh, if you just, you know, immediately want to see where it is. And I have the plans right here um, uh, for the benefit of the meeting, but I can do I that. Think I'd I think I'd rather look at it uh, and examine it on my own afterwards. Okay. 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 So um, last but not least, um, I realize what you're saying about this has been a long process and and we weren't really aware of this. I'm sure we've come across and seen it, but we were thinking more about the library project and the, the fire station. There were all these other projects going on, but this is again late in the process. But if in talking with people in our neighborhood, if people do strongly object, is there a means, what does one do if one um, does not want to support the dog park? I, I'll try to answer that. Um, I don't, I've lived in this town for 32 years. I love this town. I'm not aware of any project in the town that was supported unanimously by everybody in the town. It's just not gonna happen. I think what we look for and we've always looked for is people to come to our meetings and talk to us and raise comments and concerns. Um, there has been, an overwhelming level of support for the dog park. You know, up until this meeting, we've virtually had no concerns from any of the public about the dog park. The one concern was a worry of dog owners who currently take their dogs off leash in conservation areas um, legally before 10 o'clock, worried that that bylaw would be changed. and. We voted as a committee in support of keeping the town bylaws the way they are in terms of when off-leash activity is allowed. Other than that, the response has been very positive, including donations from some of the closest people to being abutters of the park. Um, so in terms of what you can do if you're against the park, I would say talk to us and we'll talk to you about your concerns. And if if there are legitimate concerns, then we will do our best to mitigate them and make things better. Um, hang on, I see one of our members wants to make a comment. So Nina, go ahead. I have a question. Um, what's the like official definition of an abutter? Dave, you know. Size as an abutter. That's pr I know what it is, but like, what are the qualifications of that? It, it depends. It depends on what process. So anyone whose property abuts the parcel would be considered an abutter. And then depending on what process in a town, um, the planning board or the zoning board of appeals um, determines a, a, a distance. It's typically something like 300 feet or you know, 400 feet. Um, and it varies depending on the process. So what, who would be an abutter to this project? Uh, anybody, anybody, anybody's property who touches this is certainly an abutter, um, whose, whose property, private property abuts the 50 some odd acre landfill is an abutter. And then it depends where you go from there. Yeah. So like, Anyone whose property touches the whole entire 50 acres, not just the dog park, would be in a butter? Since we're building it on, since we're building it on one parcel, it's all, there may be two, two or three small parcels, but the, the landfill itself is one big parcel. Um, so yeah, it would be, you know, a lot of it is, so, so there's not as many abutters to a 55 acre parcel as you might think, 
direct abutters because um, the town owns Route 9, which is the northern edge. And then um, there's uh, one landowner who abuts us to the south uh, because this parcel kind of goes right through the pond to the south. If you know where the kettle pond is to the south, uh, the um, 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 Mr. Lavertier owns that parcel. So uh, most of the abutters are to the west and southwest along Amherst Woods. I was just wondering, because I remember when we did have a conversation about abutters a while ago, and I just wanted clarification because I remembered it didn't seem like there were very many that would be, you know, their property touching the. Again, you know, we'd be either town staff or, or Jim as chair. We'd be happy to meet with anyone on this on this uh, Zoom call that has questions, or if anyone in the neighborhood has questions or concerns, happy to happy to meet with them. Yeah. Okay. Just just looking at a map in terms of the dog park area, the closest anything to the dog park is the transfer station on the other side of Route Nine. And then the next closest thing after that are the businesses um, that you can see from Larkspur Drive, but are actually on Research Drive. That's where um, Kate Atkinson's um, medical practices and a couple other things. Um, pretty far away. There are no residential abutters to where the dog park is going to be. Uh, Jim? Yeah. Oh. So, Nola Steven here, there was a question Peggy asked which wasn't answered. And uh, she asked about if the money, if the funds that were uh, sort of locked in were not used for the dog part, could it be used for another special project? And I'm, I'm not sure if that was answered. In other words, another project that would fit into the general category. Um, okay, so the, the bulk of our funds are from the Stanton Foundation. They're the ones who are really funding the building of the park. And the answer yeah. is a definite no to that. Our grant was a very site-specific grant. And so right. if, if we change sites at this date, it would involve a new grant proposal to Stanton Foundation. In terms okay. of the people who have donated money, I don't know. We would really need to go back to every individual and find out if their donation still held or not. Um, yeah, but the, the bulk of the funding, the answer is no. It cannot be switched by us to a different location. We would have to get new funding. I, I think that we were thinking of the, the funds from the town that would go towards that. So the town funding, the CPA grant, um, right. We'd have to look at the wording to see if it's site specific, but I think it is site specific as well, but I'm not sure about that. Um, again, yeah. that's um, a little more than 10% of the project, so it's not a big part of it. Right, mm -hmm. thanks. Actually, Any Jay, other? could I ask you just one quick thing? Um, Dave, sure. you who's mentioned- speaking? That you should identify yourself because it's hard to tell sometimes. Oh. I'm sorry, it's Colleen speaking again. Okay. Dave, you've um, generously offered a couple times to meet people at the site. I'm wondering um, if maybe through the Amherst Woods listserv, we could have a date where anybody that's interested could meet you there to get a walkthrough. And it would allow, you know, neighbors to get a firsthand look at it. Instead of you meeting up with just one or two people, maybe advertise it. Dave? Up, you're muted, Dave. <laughs> Sorry, there I am. Um, yeah, no, again, yeah, the offer stands. I guess what would be most effective is maybe if someone from the association, perhaps one of you on this call, could email me and we could come up with a couple of possible dates. Um, you know, and I'm not opposed to if it's more convenient doing it on a Saturday morning or something like that. We could do that if that would gather more people. Um, and what I would probably do is have Stephanie Ciccarello, our sustainability coordinator, come along because, again, tonight's focus is the dog park. But I know from the, from the questions that are being generated, um, it sounds to me like there are as many questions about what might happen 
relative to the solar project on the North Landfill across Route 9. So these projects are related, but um, they are not, one is not contingent on the other. So the dog park is moving ahead, you know, in all likelihood this summer. Um, we are moving forward with solar on the landfill. That project, frankly, that's been in, that's been in the uh, landfill on, on one of the, land, excuse me, solar on one of the landfills has been in the works longer than the dog park, but that project is moving forward as well. So I think having Stephanie and myself there, we, but between the two of us, we could answer any questions, uh, address any concerns about the dog park project or what might happen on the remainder of the 50 plus or minus acres on the, on the old landfill. So if that would be helpful, you know, I'd offer that and somebody could just email me and then we could coordinate a date. Jack, you have something to add to that? Yeah, I just I'm just looking at, at the map and, and it's it's so it's really uh, over a thousand feet uh, to the nearest residences within Amherst Woods, which is on Tanglewood Road. And again, there's no line of sight to the dog park from Tanglewood or from the rear of the properties on Tanglewood that border the landfill. Um, I just want to make that. No, and obviously there, there will be, you know, with the parking on Old, old Belgertown Road, uh, which I think we've discussed, but that I can see that being perhaps an issue, but I just, I feel like it's, it's very far from the Amherst Woods uh, uh, community. And I, um, I, Peggy, this is Peggy Matthews Nelson speaking. I'd be happy to um, schedule something with you, David, and um, but I'm wondering if we could have, um, and maybe it would be possible to have someone from the state also uh, walk the property with us. It, would that be possible? Because I, um, I also want to clarify about the location of this project. Um, we've always said that the landfill, um, the, the two neighborhoods, there are actually two neighbors that, neighborhoods in question here. One is um, Eastwoods, which is Tanglewood Road. Um, that's not part of Amherst Woods, um, but our main street, the main street of Amherst Woods is Wildflower Drive, which is one entrance to the old landfill. And we have another street, Lady Slippers Circle, that overlooks the pond uh, portion. And then um, a little farther over is Larkspur Drive, uh, which is a good distance from the landfill, but um, the end of Larkspur does um, you know, it does, it does meet at Old Belcher Town Road. Again, that's slightly outside the confines of the Amherst Woods neighborhood property. But, um, so we've always said that we are three-sided with the old South landfill. Um, so anything that happens on that old landfill is in fact right in the middle of uh, the East Woods neighborhood and the Amherst Woods neighborhood. So it's always of great interest to the residents here. Um, it does have an impact on, um, on our properties and on the quality of life here. So that's, um, I was a bit chagrined that, that we are in fact abutters and live and uh, neighbors of this property as Dave pointed out, um, but we really weren't involved in the process, which now I understand has been going on for three years. Um, and, um, that, that is of concern. Yes, yes. Uh, the other thing I wanted to um, say that um, another point that was brought up much, much earlier was the idea that the dog part might enhance the bird habitat. And uh, from just a, a short review of the Massachusetts Audubon Society guidelines for grassland bird habitat, 60 acres is usually what's preferred for the grasshopper sparrow. The acreage on the old landfill is only 53, as you all have cited. Um, so anything that obscures the view um, or seems to diminish the open space for the grassland birds can impact uh, from the Audubon Society's perspective anyway. They talk about avoiding disturbances and um, limiting any visual barriers to encourage the grassland birds 
the endangered birds to nest on the site. So uh, I don't, I really, it seems, I think when I first heard that this site was proposed, that the old landfill site that was designated protected habitat in perpetuity, that was part of the settlement that allowed the solar array on the north landfill to go forward, I thought that couldn't possibly happen because it's protected bird habitat. Who, who would put dogs, a dog park on protected bird habitat? So I think that's why I'm here tonight feeling very confused that this has gone as far as it has gone and that the neighborhood hasn't been part of the process. And um, I'm really interested to find out what the state um, National, Heritage. National Her Natural Heritage and um, Endangered Species Authorities. I'm, I'm wondering how they're actually looking at this process For the, from the bird's perspective, not from the dog's perspective. I'm also a dog lover, but I also love birds. So I just, I just want to repeat, I think it's really important to look at the map and to look at the location of the dog park as it relates to the rest of the landfill. The portion of the landfill that's currently a breeding area and a habitation for the birds mm -hmm. is not in view of the dog park. The dog park is not in view of this other section. Um, it's a tiny portion of the landfill. It's actually the portion physically farthest away from Tanglewood Road or from Wildflower. Um, so as Jack said earlier, there are no sight lines. Um, and all this was taken into consideration. I feel that based on the emails that I received from people and that I saw on the listserv, people have this impression of the entire landfill being paved over and filled with crazy barking dogs. And it's really not the case. You really need to look carefully at the map and look at our site location and go there and walk around and see what it's like. And I think that'll help you understand why we've come to understand, based on discussions with a lot of different people, that the dog park will not have a negative impact on the rest of the landfill. In fact, it's the people walking through, looking at these lovely birds that probably have more of a negative impact on the habitat than the dog park will. Um, which is why even though it might affect some people's walks and some people's views, in the long run, people like the state agencies and the Kestrel Foundation are in agreement that a fence around the larger portion of the landfill is probably a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've got a couple committee members with their hands raised. We'll go to Gina first and then Ted. Uh, Dave, I just think, I, I just was, was wondering if you could um, just repeat how many times you met with the National Heritage Foundation about the bird issue. Um, how many times that you've met with the state already about this? Oh. Sure, so just to clarify, it's called the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program. Um, these folks, this is their job. They are there to protect the habitat for what, what we call state listed species. Um, and those species like the grasshopper sparrow and, and various uh, plants, insects, uh, mussels in streams, um, uh, all of all of this uh, is their purview, and so there is, as I said before, a relationship between uh, the dog park and the solar project. Um, but on this site, really, the only addition to the 50 plus acres out out back to the west will be a fence that will safeguard the, <coughs> the habitat of the uh, of the grasshopper sparrow in perpetuity. Now keep in mind, the, the landfill itself, the habitat is not currently protected in perpetuity. The only way that happens is when we go to build the solar project, the town will be required to put a conservation restriction on the land. That is a legally binding document. It'll be held by the Kestrel Trust and they will essentially watch over that habitat. We will, we will manage it for grassland birds but the Kestrel Trust will be the third party that will watch over the habitat and watch the town in perpetuity to make sure that we keep that habitat open and, and available for grassland birds. 
I'm going to say we have probably, between conversations uh, and in-person meetings, I'm going to say probably uh, eight to ten meetings with the Natural Heritage Program. Um, we've had uh, almost that number of meetings with the Department of Environmental Protection. As I said before, they oversee capped landfills. Um, so we've studied that landfill. We've studied that area of the landfill where we're, where we're building the uh, dog park. Um, to make sure it's safe for humans, to make sure it's safe for dogs, and to make sure uh, what we're building is safe for the landfill cap itself. <clears throat> and all of those, all of those conversations have happened with DEP. Ted, you had a comment? Yeah, I just, I just want to add, I'm Ted Diamond. I live in Amherst Woods down on Woodlot Road. I'm also a veterinarian uh, who, who's been in the community for more than 35 years. And I just don't think that we brought up tonight, uh, we haven't discussed all the positive effects of having a dog park. Um, I understand that there might be a concern on the part of neighbors of having such a development uh, in their neighborhood. I think it's been pointed out how far away it is from any home and it's very unlikely that anyone in the neighborhood will even know it's there except if they pay a visit. Uh, and, I, and I agree with Dave, if you go down and walk around and see how far it is from anywhere, you'll realize that even if a dog is barking, you're never gonna hear it up on Tanglewood or Larkspur or Wildflower. Um, I think that the, you know, in fact, it's the opposite. If you live in Amherst Woods or Amherst uh, up on Tanglewood there, this is a positive thing for your property value, not a negative, a very positive thing. When people are looking to move into the neighborhood and their dog owners and lovers, which many are, finding that there's a dog park within walking distance is a very positive thing for anybody looking to come into this neighborhood. And I think you should consider that uh, more so than any negative effects. Um, I think that it's also, you have to realize how important it is for the dogs in this area to have an opportunity to socialize off the leash, especially those dogs that are not able to run free off the leash in other conservation areas where they do uh, at the appointed hours. And so many dogs in this town have no socialization uh, with other dogs, and that creates a lot of aggressive and poorly socialized animals. If you walk with your dog down the street around here, more often than not, the dogs that you might meet are very poorly socialized and not friendly with each other when they're on a leash. And I believe it's partly because they don't have opportunities to play with other dogs from the time they're puppies and, and, and adults. And finally, uh, I think it needs to be said that this is a very positive thing for the town uh, as a whole because it's a, an area where dog lovers, as they do at all the parks, will be able to gather, but will bring a whole another community of dog people together, especially following COVID. The need for people to reconnect with each other through their dogs is going to be greater than ever. And I think it also can be done safely from a social distance point of view at a dog park because it is large enough that even if there's six or eight dogs there, the people don't have to be on top of each other. So I think it has many positive benefits for not only the people in Amherst Woods, but for the town as a whole. And I think those need to be weighed against the concerns that I've heard raised tonight. So those are my comments. Um, yeah, Nina. Um, I just want to add that something that I, I've thought about a lot is right now people are, we're allowed to walk the dogs off leash before 10 a.m. Um, and that's a great, a great thing to have, but it's not accessible to everyone. I mean, a lot of people work in the morning and yes, you can get up before, before work and walk your dog. I do it, but it is, it is very difficult. And I think that like, having somewhere that doesn't have that type of restriction will allow different people from different working situations, different classes can, you know, form a community of like over their shared love of dogs. Um, 
So I think that that's one important piece because the before 10 a.m. restriction um, really gets in the way for a lot of people. Um, so it'll be great to have more access um, to that kind of thing. Uh, so Nola Steven here, I, I just want to support Peggy. Um, I don't feel that the neighborhood has been directly involved in consultation and I would like to see something maybe a late morning on a weekend and I don't see the problem in having someone from the state being involved in this. I think it would be important certainly to people in the neighborhood. Um, again, if somebody, you know, if somebody from the neighborhood wants to email me, that's fine and we can find a time um, to meet. Um, I really, I can't guarantee anybody from the state, you know, the state doesn't work for me or for the town of Amherst. Um, you know, I will say that, you know, this has been an exhaustive project process uh, with the leading experts in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for grassland birds and no disrespect to the Audubon Society. I've worked with them for 25 years. Um, but they are not a regulatory agency. Uh, they do wonderful conservation work and they're very knowledgeable about grassland birds. But we have been working with the experts and the regulators uh, of these kinds of projects. So we are moving toward uh, finalizing uh, all of our permits and, and our um, management agreement with the state for not only this project, but also for the landfill solar across the across the way. So happy to meet on a Saturday. Let's exchange emails. I, I think everybody can reach me at zomekd at amherstma.gov and um, we can set up a time that and see how many um, neighbors or butters uh, might come and we'll talk it through and so I'll ask Stephanie Ciccarello to be there who does work for me and, and uh, works alongside me uh, for the town. And I would hope that you could set up something that would allow some other representatives to be part of this. Um, I, I would. Th I yeah. think what Dave is saying is he'll he'll do the best he can, but there's no guarantee. Um, sure. And I think I think we've been we've been involved in the public comment section of our meeting for a long time, and I think we need to wrap it up. We have a couple more committee business things to do and our meeting was scheduled to end at 8.30 and we're past that already. So I think we need to wrap things up. Um, yeah, I, just, I, hey, here, just one more comment. I just wanted to say that I'm not at all opposed to a dog park. My concern is with the impact of a dog park on the bird habitat. And that's my only concern about this. It's not about the um, impact of property values. It's not about the visual sight lines of a dog park or um, any of that on the old landfill. It's really um, concern about the impact that a dog park and that kind of presence of people and you know, 18 parking spaces, people and dogs on that site, what kind of impact that might have on the bird habitat. So that's been my concern. Not, not opposed to a dog park in Amherst, uh, love dogs. And um, uh, that's why we're raising these concerns now and um, wish we had uh, been involved earlier. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you both for participating and being here in our meeting. Um, Thanks. Moving on, I don't, I don't have any other items not anticipated by the chair. Do any other committee members have any other items that they feel need to be discussed in this meeting? I don't see any hands raised. Um, in terms of our next meeting date, um, I think rather than try and pick a date at this moment, we should sort of pick a time frame of when we want to meet and then I can send out a doodle poll. Um, to get an actual date. So, Dave, do you have a sense of how soon our next meeting should be? Um, looking at the calendar here, um, you know, somewhere say, you know, the week of maybe the 15th of June. Okay. You know, maybe, um, maybe the 18th. Okay, so why don't I, I will send out a 
doodle poll for probably for every day that week and we'll see what we have in common. And, you know, nobody yet knows if we're back at work during the day at those times or not. So I'll probably do in the poll, there'll be a morning time slot, an afternoon time slot, and an evening time slot again. And we'll try and find something we all have in common. That sound good? Okay. Um, in that case, I think I thank everybody for coming and participating and taking the time out of your evening. Your home spaces and rooms all look lovely. Um, and this meeting, I guess, guess we have to, we need to have a roll call vote on adjourning. I guess we do. So the motion I'm making is to adjourn this meeting. And I'm Jim Pistrang and I'm in favor of adjourning. And Gina, how about you? Uh, I'm Gina Fusco, and I'm in favor of adjourning. And Ted? Ted Diamond, adjourn, please. <laughs> Michael. <laughs> Michael Chessworth, adjourn. Um, Anna? Anna Dublin Gothier, agree, time to adjourn. <laughs> and Ellen? Ellen Kiter, yes, adjourn. And, and Jack? Uh, we can't hear you, you're muted. <laughs> You're holding up the whole process. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yes. Adjourn. Hey! Okay. Off to a Go to line. somewhere sunny and sandy. Okay. It's a unanimous <laughs> agreement to adjourn. So in that case, this meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming. I'm going to end the meeting. Thanks, Dave. Good to see you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.